Hello, uh, this is our fluid mechanical delivery section for our centrifugal pump. The assumptions we're making are that the flow is incompressible, the velocities are time average, the flow is two dimensional, and uh, it also has constant density. Our Reynolds number would usually be large because centrifugal pumps usually involve high flow rate and low viscosity. The actual flow is three dimensional, but because this is an introductory physics class, uh, fluids class, we will be doing two dimensional analysis. And <clears throat> centrifugal pumps consist of three main parts, the impeller, the vanes, and the volute casing. The main point of these pumps is that the impeller does work on the fluid to increase its velocity, and then the casing trades this velocity for pressure. As you can see from this diagram, the cross-sectional area of the volute casing increases. For this analysis, we will consider a streamline from the eye of the impeller to the exit of the pump, as shown in blue. By conservation of mass for an incompressible fluid, the velocity of the fluid decreases along a streamline, and by Bernoulli's principle, the fluid pressure rises. So one of the ways in which we analyze these is velocity diagrams. So at the design speed and design conditions, the flow is going to be smooth. And as we can see here, the relative velocity W, we're going to assume is tangent at the inlet and outlet. And then we also have the uh, vector velocity of the blade itself, which is U. And that's always going to be circumferential because uh, U is the cross product of the angular velocity omega with the position vector R. And then we also have the absolute velocity, which is V. And that's going to be uh, coming to terms later when we talk about the governing equations for this. The impellers of a centrifugal pump must face backwards to ensure stable operation in the form of a negative slope on the discharge versus head graph. Otherwise, as the pressure resisting the pump increases, the flare rate of the pump increases, leading to a potentially destructive positive feedback loop. This comes at a cost in terms of pressure rise, however, since the components of the fluid velocity U and W now point in nearly opposing directions. One of the important aspects of a centrifugal pump is the suction at the inlet, which increases the flow rate and efficiency of the pump. Uh, this can be derived using Bernoulli's equation, where we can draw a streamline between the inlet pipe outside of the eye and some point inside the impeller. The fluid in the impeller is moving faster than the fluid outside, in the, uh, outside of the eye, so we can say that by Bernoulli, the pressure in the impeller is lower than the pressure at the inlet pipe. Because of this, there's a pressure gradient between the two points, which causes suction. So the governing equations for these machines are Euler's turbo machinery principles. And that basically comes from, we use a finite control volume enclosing the rotor vanes. And then we apply conservation of angular momentum. And we assume that the viscous losses are low and that it's steady flow and that the gravitational force bounces out. And then we basically get this equation below for the torque on the shaft, which relates the inlet conditions with the outlet conditions. Then we could dot product this with the angular velocity omega. And then we get the power requirements for a pump. And this can also be in terms of head, which is on the right, which is sort of the more industrial equivalent, which is used more often. Once again, here, we could just use the velocity diagram, which we've previously derived. And this gives us a much more conceptually easy to under understand equation relating all the different velocities. To find pump performance, we must first find the ideal head of the pump, which shows a linear relationship with flow rate for, for ideal head. This is because as flow rate increases, tangential velocity decreases, reducing the work done on the fluid and thereby decreasing head rise. However, actual head differs from ideal head due to head losses. These losses are due to friction and viscous effects, which cannot be easily represented with an explicit relationship with flow rate. Due to this complexity, we must use an experimental setup, where we use the Bernoulli equation on a head basis to find the actual head. As there is work done by the shaft and their head losses, we must sum those with the initial fluid properties to accurately find the exit condition. With the experimental setup, we already know the inlet and outlet conditions, so we can solve for actual head loss easily. To find the operating point for a pump, we must find the intersection of the pump performance curve and the pipe or system performance curve. This, operating, this is the operating point, as at this point, both the system and the pump will give the same head rise for a, for a specific flow rate. Once this operating point is found, to find the best pump for a specific flow rate, we must find up the pump where the operating point is near the peak of the efficiency curve. The peak is at a given flow rate as the efficiency of a pump is proportional to flow rate. Further, the efficiency equation shown is a direct result of the Euler's turbo, turbo machinery principles. To find a pump for a specific application given head and uh, flow rate, we can use the hydraulic coverage chart to find the size of the pump needed. And then we can use the pump performance chart as sort of a zoom in, a zoom in tool to find the uh, size of the impeller blades for that specific application. Centrifugal pumps are just one of many different types of rotodynamic pumps, and these pumps are differentiated by the specific speeds at which they most effectively operate. Centrifugal pumps have the lowest specific speeds, which means they operate best at high output heads and low output flow rates. Positive suction heads the effective fluid height above the inlet of a centrifugal pump required to prevent cavitation. Cavitation is the process by which the fluid being pumped boils inside the pump due to the local pressure falling below the vapor pressure of the fluid. When the vapor bubbles formed by the cavitation collapse, they cause shock waves which damage the pump over time. NPSH can either be given by the manufacturer or estimated by the equation on the right.